So call the field to rest and let's away to part the glories of this happy day. So says Gaius Octavius, the soon-to-be emperor of Rome, in the final words of William Shakespeare's classic play, Julius Caesar. So call the fields to rest and let's away to part the glories of this happy day. Now, having once been a high school English teacher, my admiration for Shakespeare's Julius Caesar is immense. In my opinion, it is the most teachable of all of Shakespeare's plays. But I don't bring up Julius Caesar this morning so as to talk about Julius Caesar. Instead, I bring up Julius Caesar this morning so as to highlight for you these particular words. Or more particularly, particularly to highlight for you where these particular words were spoken and then why these particular words were spoken and then finally who these particular words were spoken by. And here are the answers to those questions. These words were spoken in a Roman colony called Philippi. And again, they were spoken by Gaius Octavius, the man who would soon become to call Caesar Augustus, Savior of the world. And they were spoken in celebration of a very climactic moment. For here in this moment, Octavius and his forces had just won the decisive battle in the war that would shift Rome from a republic to an empire. In other words, this was a seminal moment in Western civilization. One captured centuries later in this poetic language by William Shakespeare, and it all happened in a Roman colony called Philippi. And here's why that matters for us this morning. It matters for us this morning because in order for us to fully appreciate what the Apostle Paul is saying when he writes to the Christian disciples in Philippi, some 100 years after Octavius' decisive victory there, in order for us to fully appreciate what Paul is saying to the church in Philippi, we must first appreciate the significance of Philippi to the Roman Empire. For if we don't realize that Philippi is and has been at this point an important outpost of the Roman Empire, and that consequently the Philippians are card-carrying citizens of Rome, then we will quite likely miss the very point Paul is making when he talks about citizenship in heaven at the letter's end. But in saying that, I am getting too far ahead of myself because I am not yet ready to talk about the point Paul is making at his letter's end. Because instead, I want to first talk to you about a trip I took to Indonesia about 15 years ago. Now, this trip took place, I think, in 2006. I've been invited by an international school in Seoul, South Korea, to come and be the discipleship leader for their middle school's mission trip to Indonesia. So while the trip was ultimately to Indonesia, I first flew into South Korea And there got to spend about 48 hours in Seoul with these students at their school. And one of the very first things that I noticed when arriving at the school was that this international school was precisely that. It was international. Which is to say there were kids there from South Korea, yes, but there were also kids from many other Asian countries as well, along with kids from African countries, 
and kids from both Eastern and Western European countries, and kids from Latin American countries. In short, it was a true melting pot of a school, a true international school, with many different countries and with many different cultures being represented. Now, I soon learned that the reason for this was because the school, being, you know, an international school, thus drew the children of international business leaders who were on assignment there in South Korea, as well as the children of foreign ambassadors, that is, of those official representatives of foreign countries assigned to do the bidding of their own governments there in South Korea. And so here's why I bring this all up this morning. I bring it all up so as to tell you this. By the time we got to Indonesia, I began to notice how these teenagers, though bonded by their shared experience at this school, how they nonetheless continued to make evident display of their differences. That is, of the differences between their particular cultures. Thus, the styles of clothing they wore was not all uniform, as is so often the case among teenagers. And the way they carried themselves and the slang they used was not homogenous, as is so often the case among teenagers. And even the music they listened to and the entertainment they talked about were not born of the same tastes and same trends, as is almost always the case among teenagers. Now instead, while they had formed strong friendships with one another, they nonetheless still bore the unmistakable influences of the countries from which they'd come of the backgrounds by which they'd been shaped, of the distinct cultures of which they, like their parents, were representatives. And so to make this point crystal clear, because it will become very important later in this sermon, here is what I'm trying to highlight for you through this story. These teenagers were now living in South Korea, but rather than living like South Koreans, that is, rather than sacrificing the distinctives of their own cultures, instead they were fully settled into this new culture, but all the while representing their own which in the end is the very purpose of an ambassador. Not to blend in with the citizens of the country to which she is assigned, and certainly not to pine to return to the country she is representing, but rather to represent the policies and the personalities and the prerogatives of her true country right there where she's been assigned. Do you follow all of that? Okay, I'm glad you do. Because if not, I have no idea how I would build a bridge from there back to the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Philippians. Because you see, when Paul begins to wind up this letter, that is when Paul begins to bring his whole message to the Philippians to a conclusion, he ultimately does so by contrasting the citizenship the Philippians hold by birth, that is, their Roman citizenship, with the citizenship they now hold by belief in the risen Christ, that is, their heavenly citizenship, as Paul puts it. Look closely with me at the text. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ, Paul writes, meaning for many live in ways utterly antithetical to the humble, self-giving, righteousness-loving, justice-seeking way of Christ. 
Meaning many live evil and corrupt lives. Meaning many lead lives of greed and rapacity and boorishness and indifference about it all. However, you, he goes on, preparing now to contrast these Philippian disciples with those around them who live in contradiction to the way of Christ. However, you, he goes on, that is, we, he goes on, that is, our, he goes on, our citizenship is in heaven. And it is from there that we are expecting a Savior. Our citizenship is in heaven. And it is from there that we are expecting a Savior. Expecting a Savior. Well, that language leads us back now to William Shakespeare and to Julius Caesar and to Gaius Octavius and to the decisive battle he won in the same Roman colony, Philippi. You see, when we read this letter 2,000 years later, we can easily overlook the significance that Roman citizenship has heretofore had for the Philippians. Just as we can easily overlook the deeply charged nature of Paul saying that Roman citizens by birth though they are, they are nonetheless now waiting for a Savior from somewhere other than Rome. For as you'll recall, this same Gaius Octavius, who closes Shakespeare's play there in the fields of Philippi, by saying, call the field to rest and let's away to part the glories of this happy day, As you'll recall, this same Gaius Octavius is he who, along with all of his successors, will soon come to be called Caesar Augustus, Lord of all, Prince of Peace, Savior of the world. The crucial point being this. Between the moment of Octavius' decisive victory at Philippi and the time some 100 years later of Paul's letter to Philippi, in those ensuing years there had been numerous instances when the Roman colony of Philippi, under great duress and some sort of urgent, desperate need, had cried out to and required help from the Roman Empire. Which is to say there had been several times in that ensuing century when the Roman citizens had looked to Rome for their Savior and when their Savior, Caesar Augustus, had come to them from Rome and delivered them from their plight. Do you follow? And so knowing that, we can now begin to see why this language Paul uses here in this letter is not at all frivolous and not at all uncontroversial either. Now our citizenship, he writes to these Roman citizens, our citizenship is in heaven. And it is from there that we expect a Savior. It's from there that we expect a Savior. Okay, let me step away from this line of thought for just a moment to highlight why I bring any of this up on this, the fourth Sunday of Advent. As you'll recall, our Advent sermon series has been focused on the coming of Christ and on what that means 
and on what our hope for that as Christians is. And to that end, we have spent time distinguishing the Judeo-Christian concept of the resurrection of the dead with the Greek philosophical concept of the immortality of the soul. And thus we have talked about how leaving earth for heaven was not the gospel as proclaimed by the earliest disciples, but instead how the gospel as proclaimed by the earliest disciples was about Christ coming from heaven to earth so as to save it, so as to rescue it, so as to redeem it, so as to remedy it of its sufferings and of its groanings, so as to transform it from the outside in and the inside out, and in so doing to resurrect us, the redeemed, to eternal life upon it. That we have spent this entire sermon series reflecting upon That is what the earliest disciples were hoping for. That is what the earliest disciples were waiting for. That is what the earliest disciples were praying for when they prayed, Come, Lord Jesus. They were praying for their Savior to come from heaven to earth to rescue the earth from its bondage and to fill it with the glory of his kingdom. So now, on this fourth and final Sunday of Advent, now we turn to this passage in Philippians chapter 3, so as to all these centuries later, through more fully understanding what it was that these Christians were expecting, so as to thereby better appreciate what it is that we as Christians are expecting ourselves. To better understand what it is that we as Christians are praying for when we, like them, pray, Come, Lord Jesus. And so to tie this all together then, let me take us back now to those teenagers in Indonesia that I told you about. The ones from that international school in South Korea. The ones who were children of those foreign ambassadors and international business leaders. The ones who, though situated in this foreign country, had nonetheless taken it as their responsibility to represent their true country, to represent its ways and its effects right there where they were. Now follow me here because this is everything. Like those children serving as representatives of their true countries right there where they were, so too are we as Christian disciples called to serve as representatives of our country. That is God's country, God's kingdom, God's dimension, heaven. Like them, so too are we called to serve as our country's representatives right here. That is our purpose as disciples. That is our purpose as ambassadors. That is our purpose as representatives. And thus that is the entire purpose of Paul using this metaphor of citizenship. For when Paul writes to the Philippians saying our citizenship is in heaven and it is from there that we are expecting a savior, Paul is not saying our citizenship is in heaven, so let's wait patiently until he comes to take us there. Now that would be to totally miss Paul's point. Not to mention to completely misunderstand Paul's metaphor of citizenship. 
For as we've just seen, the Roman citizens in Philippi did not expect their Savior, that is, Caesar Augustus, to come and rescue them by taking them out of Philippi and back to Rome. No, instead they expected him to come and do what he'd done so many times before. To come and rescue them. To come and save them by coming to where they were and putting to an end the suffering and the devastation they were experiencing. Do you follow that? They were waiting for a Savior from there to come and set things right here. That was their hope. Well, that had been their hope before now, Paul was reminding them. But now, he was reminding them, their hope was in another Savior. An altogether different kind of Savior. For now, he was reminding them, their citizenship was in another kingdom. An altogether different kind of kingdom. And thus, it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, Paul writes. Meaning a Savior who will come and finally set right all that is broken and this good creation that He fashioned in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, And the Word was of God. And the Word was God. I close by saying this. As Advent draws to a close each year, our attention as disciples is supposed to shift from a focus on the future coming of Christ and the fullness of His kingdom to a focus on the first coming of Christ and the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Thus, the very shape of Advent is designed to remind us that we can never disconnect the one from the other. To remind us that Christ's first coming points unfailingly to His second, but that our hope for His second depends entirely upon that which He begun in His first. Advent is designed in such a way so as to remind us that the two can never be separated. And therefore, as we turn now toward Christmas Day, and as we prepare to listen to the angels proclaim that unto us on this day in the city of David a Savior has been born. As we do, let us prepare ourselves to remember that the Savior born that day is this same Savior who will come again in the fullness of His kingdom. And let us understand that this Savior is not Caesar Augustus of Rome, nor any other such would-be Savior, but that this Savior is instead that resurrected carpenter from Nazareth and Galilee, Jesus the Christ. Let us understand that in His coming, He is coming from heaven so as not to take us back there, but so as to come and set right all that's broken here, And finally, let us understand that until that day comes, and with it the grand marvel of new creation and the resurrection of the dead, let us understand that until that day comes, we are called to be representatives of that kingdom right here on earth. That is, representatives of that kingdom in which our citizenship now resides.
And so in a world where so many live as enemies of the cross and cause of Christ, that is, as human beings utterly indifferent to the suffering and the injustice in the world, and completely desensitized to the rapaciousness and greed all around, In such a world, let us wear the distinctives of our heavenly culture proudly. Standing up to evil and injustice in all its forms and making always manifest the fruits of Christ's spirit. That is our job as disciples. That is our job as ambassadors That is our job as representatives of heaven on earth. Oh, my dear family, hear these words as Advent draws to a close. In a world such as this, let us wait actively and hopefully and expectantly for the world that is to come. And in a world such as this, let us wait actively and hopefully and expectantly for the day when our Savior will finally call the fields to rest and invite us to part the glories of that happy day. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.